Welcome to the Assembly Sacramento! So that video was put together for um, the Sunday Assembly International Conference that they just had called, it was a conference called Wonder, and it took place in Atlanta, it's the second one they've done, they did one last year, and um, from everything I heard it was successful, very successful, so. Uh, Alright, so first off, make sure your cell phones are, please, are turned off, please, or on silent. Uh, emergency exits are here, as well as down there, don't forget your kids. Uh, Sunday Assembly is a secular community that celebrates life. Our motto is to live better, help often, and wonder more. Um, so we'll just get started right away. If I, if I ask you to compare these two apples, what's the first thing you notice? Color. Color, perfect. Oh, I'm so glad that worked. Okay, <laughs> differences are so obvious to us, right? They stand out. Um, the same goes for people. It's so easy to notice differences between individuals. Um, so often secular and religious communities butt heads. Um, but if there's ever any discourse and dialogue and understanding, we have to find a way to bridge the gap in our differences of opinion and find common ground. Carl Sagan, a well-known um, scientist, author, and atheist, said, in the way that skepticism is sometimes applied to issues of public concern, there is a tendency to belittle, to condescend, to ignore the fact that religious people are human beings with real feelings, who, like the skeptics, are trying to figure out how the world works and what our role in it might be. Their motives are in many cases consonant with science. Did you know that during the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church founded Europe's first universities? They produced scholars who helped establish the scientific method. During this period, the church was also a great patron of engineering for their massive, uh, elaborate cathedrals. And then since the Renaissance, Catholic scientists have been credited as fathers of a diverse range of scientific fields. Jean-Baptiste Lamarck prefigured the theory of evolution with Lamarckism. Uh, Friar Gregor Mendel was a pioneer in genetics. Um, Father Georges Lemaitre, I'm not French, <laughs> proposed the Big Bang cosmological model. Um, the current papal astronomer, Brother Guy Consolmagno, describes science as an act of worship and as a way of getting intimate with the Creator. And it's not just Christianity who had a hand in early science and math. Uh, when you write numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so forth, you're writing Arabic numerals. Arabic as an Arab, as an Islam. Uh, the decimal place value system was fully developed in the Arab world. Al-Khwarizmi is known as the father of algebra. Algebra itself is an Arab word, algebra, right? Uh, Ibn al-Haytham was a significant figure in the history of the scientific method as well. So all of these developments, they're not just for the religious people, they're not just for, for the secular people. It's something that all of humanity shares. Whatever our differences are, all of us, religious, non-religious, old, young, male, female, we all share a common human history. Building bridges between communities of differently, differently minded people affirms the shared humanity. So we're going to get started with a reading. Every month we have a reading. Um, for this month we're going to go ahead and bring up Amber. Everyone give Amber a hand. nervous, so don't laugh. <laughs> and I was going to start, David didn't give me a lot of guidance. He said that the theme is togetherness. And so the first thing I wanted to read you is a quote from Carl Sagan. Thanks for not saying um, It's one of my favorites where he says, we are all made of star stuff. Our bodies are made of star stuff. And there are pieces of stars within all of us. Which I think kind of ties into all of us being together as one, this big community in the world. And um, does anyone know who Victor Harris is? Besides you? <laughs> <laughs> um, he lives in San Francisco and he does spoken word poetry. And I heard him introduce Neil deGrasse Tyson last year. And the poem that he used I thought would be really fitting but it's really a little longer, so I didn't memorize it. But um, he calls it weird science, so I'm going to try to do a 10 as best as his reading, because if you ever look him up on YouTube, he's really amazing. Um, so it goes, I am an example, I am an amazing example, amalgamation of milliseconds, a constellation of coincidences, 
a collection of infinitely small spans of time that separate me from the possibility of my bloodline. I have managed to outswim and outmaneuver 500 millions of my brothers and sisters to be here today, continuing a chain of happenstance that began moments after the Big Bang, and that brought the universe into being. Matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed, so the same molecules that make up me in this instance have been exi in existence for over 13 billion years. We are heavenly, but there is no godly hand in the evidence of the creation of man. I can instead trace my evidence of my being into the cosmos. The same elements that make me unique have been sourced to create the universe. Stars died and galaxies gave their lives to form our fingertips. How can we not find wonder in waking up and be amazed each day when we open our eyes? Each day we're granted more time on this little blue marble, floating through the vast emptiness of space. I am in awe of my life, and to quote Carl Sagan again, I find it elevating and exhilarating to discover that we live in a universe which permits the evolution of molecular machines as intricate and subtle as we are. I am left breathless by the understanding that my continuance is an example of the improbable versus the impossible. And despite what some people might think, this gives my life more meaning, makes each day more precious, lends weight and reality to the precious actuality of each person we allow into our lives. Because we see that they are an amalgamation of milliseconds, a compilation of coincidences, and a collection of infinitely small spans of time. So I lend assistance where I am able, offer compassion when I can, and I hug anyone when life's weight proves to be too great for them to stand. Because these memories will be the markers of our legacy, allowing us to exist for eternity, or at least a few years past my mental exit from this planet. A few years past my physical ex exit from this planet. A few years past that moment when my atoms are reconnected with the cosmos. So we should live our lives happy and relaxed, because we know we could be gone tomorrow. And like Stephen Hawking said, when your expectations are reduced to zero, you really appreciate everything that you have. And so that just makes me think that we all just need to remember we're part of something bigger and just, I guess, love and accept everybody, even the weird ones like me. <laughs> Great. Uh, next up, we have our, our main speaker for today. Awesome. Who is Gary Alexander? We'll give that Gary a hand. I'm uh, kind of old-fashioned. I actually wrote everything down, but uh, I'm also not a quick reader, so I'm gonna watch out for this <laughs> So uh, thank you, everybody, for coming, and thanks for participating in this uh, new secular congregation movement. Uh, my name is Gary Alexander, and I'm an organizer for SACFAN. I'm a board member for the Reason Center, and I'm one of the four co-founders for the multi-belief discussion group that I'll be talking about later. Like Sunday Assembly, our group is radically inclusive. Anybody from any faith is welcome, as long as you can behave civilly. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, today I'm going to talk to you a bit about the group, and um, in, in the case that anybody here is interested in starting something similar, uh, and then I'm going to give you some tips on how to communicate with those on the other side of the belief spectrum. Uh, we started this group at the beginning of the year, two atheists and two Christians agreed that there would be a benefit to have many believers and non-believers meet regularly. Uh, we thought it would be beneficial if individuals with different perspectives and core beliefs could get together and share these differences without the worry of arguments or aggression. We've had three public meetings, or three meetings with public participation so far. Uh, each meeting has had a specific topic to explore. The first was about belief and the definitions of our respective points of view. 
The second was about epistemology, or how one determines what is true. And the third was about morality, which is such a large topic with so many differences that we decided we're probably going to break that up into multiple meetings. Um, the meetings are scheduled roughly six weeks apart, and they're supposed to go for about an hour and a half, but pretty much everybody ends up staying late to just chat with everybody they've either just met or chat with people to, to catch up. Um, the logistics are not really the interesting aspect of this idea, though they do require a lot of our time. Um, the interesting part is, uh, for the participants, is what they learn from each other and uh, having our beliefs challenged. Um, the interesting facet of this group to me as an organizer is why we are doing it, and I'm going to get into that a little bit later. Um, first, I'd like to give you some background about the group for some context. Uh, the discussion group that we have now isn't actually what John, the other atheist, and, uh, and I originally set out to create a year and a half ago. Uh, we wanted to get a group of atheists and Christians to spar regularly, eventually having public debates. We like the idea of, um, of having people who would be willing to challenge their ideas regularly, and then eventually showing the public uh, what we had explored about each other's ideas, but in, in kind of a, in a formal debate type setting. Um, John, who did the lion's share of the effort on this project and the current group, uh, found a pastor at a church who wanted to participate. Um, he liked the idea of having members of his church practice their apologetics with atheists. Um, apologetics, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, doesn't mean saying sorry. It's referring to the Greek word apologia, which means the defense of your ideas. Um, John and I had a test meeting with this pastor and some of their friends, and uh, it was interesting, and I thought it went quite well. We did a little sparring, but it was friendly. Um, afterwards, they decided they didn't want to move forward with this idea. <laughs> John and I prodded them to try to understand what changed their mind. Um, now, with hindsight being 2020, I can say that if you uh, approach a group and you say, would you like to spend a few hours every month uh, having your beliefs assaulted, they may not be down for that. <laughs> um, John then reached out to another church, Bayside Church in Granite Bay. It's a very conservative and massive evangelical style church. Dina, who's an employee at the direct, uh, and a director at Bayside, agreed to meet with us to discuss a possible discussion group with individuals on both sides of the belief spectrum. With Dina's help, John and I reworked our more aggressive concept into a more assertive concept. Uh, we soon included a fourth organizer, Dave, and started brainstorming topics. Uh, but that goes right back into the boring logistics. Um, instead, let me tell you a little bit about the organizers in the group. Um, Dina, who is the employee at uh, Bayside, um, she cares intensely about the truth and justification of her beliefs, um, in God, in the Bible, and in Jesus. Um, she cares more uh, about the truth and reality than most non-believers that I know. Us non-believers should not assume that believers believe out of comfort or ignorance. Uh, Dina holds a degree in philosophy and a master's in apologetics. Uh, Dave is also well-versed in apologetics, and he's uh, very knowledgeable when it comes to logic and reason. Um, and he has a talent for taking a complex idea and breaking it down so that others can understand. Um, he also knows his Bible, and uh, that uh, also helps. He also knows the history and the, and the um, the scholastic history, I should say, of the Bible. Um, now about John. John and I met in 2001. I'm estimating that because it was a long time ago. Uh, when we both worked for this internet cafe slash gaming center. Um, we were both Christians at the time. A uh, better way to put it might be that I was trying to be a Christian because I was trying to marry a Pentecostal girl. But... <laughs> I was still genuinely putting in the effort to try to be Christian at the time. Um, we saw each other pretty often for a few years. We played D&D together. And eventually our paths just veered in different directions and we lost touch. 
In uh, 2013, John saw me on the SACFAN site listed as an organizer, and he essentially sent me a message saying, hey, you're an atheist now, so am I. <laughs> Um, going back to the reason for this discussion group, um, each of us sees a benefit to reaching across the aisle. Uh, we all have individual reasons that the others don't share necessarily, but the reasons that we do share are summarized well in our mission statement. To help local believers and non-believers foster understanding and conversation in seeking the truth. All of us want to better understand reality and all of us want to better understand each other. All of us want to fight tribalism or the us versus them mentality. None of us want to just assume that our way of thinking is better or more correct. And none of us want to, to let figureheads or straw men represent our beliefs. In our society and most English speaking societies, it is generally taboo to discuss religion at the dinner table. All of us want to create a safe space for these discussions and hopefully encourage people to have these discussions more often in their personal lives. Due to social norms and our instincts, we tend to group with other similar humans or similar thinking people. Uh, there's nothing inherently wrong with this, but what could happen is that if someone surrounds themselves with only people who agree with them, they will only hear their own ideas echoed back to them. You may never hear an alternative that might be more accurate, and you may never hear a good reason why your opinion is completely wrong. So far, the feedback from our attendees has been overwhelmingly positive, regardless of where they fall on the belief spectrum. Every attendee I've asked said that they felt like they learned something from the discussion. Uh, the last thing I want to talk to you about today, so set the group stuff aside, um, I'm gonna go over some practical tips <coughs> for uh, discussing for having conversations with those who are on the opposite side of the belief spectrum, whether you're an atheist talking to Christians or a Christian talking to atheists. Um, so I picked these up over the years doing the Ask an Atheist events, and um, that's where we just walk around on the street. We let people come up to us and ask us questions. We also do this in malls. Um, it can get confrontational. But usually it's not. Usually the people who approach you are just curious. Um, so I came up with 10 tips to help you communicate with those who are on the other side of the belief spectrum. The first one is don't tell religious people that they are stupid. <laughs> and don't tell atheists or agnostics that they are immoral. Both sides share many beliefs, and we shouldn't reduce each other's complex points of view down to their stance on a single issue. Uh, the second is don't assume you are morally better, happier, or smarter than the other person on the other side. Again, each person's point of view is complex. You can learn something from anybody. Someone out there has more knowledge than you about everything that you think you know. If you are having an actual debate, or you have already agreed to discuss a topic that you know you and the other person disagree on, try to stay on topic. You may hear a lot of ideas you want to object to, write them down, and get back to them later. Interrupting is counterproductive. Finish this idea that you're discussing before you move on to the next. Um, the other, uh, number four, is if the other person is getting upset, back off. Whether your goal is to open the mind of the other person or just better understand them, you will not make any progress with someone who is already angry. <coughs> Once we're upset, our walls go up, and we're less likely to hear what the other person has to say. So talking to somebody who's already upset is not a good idea. Um, don't offer, this is number five, don't offer your personal testimony without being asked. This sounds like I'm saying this just to religious folks, but I mean this for both sides. Atheists, or those who have left religion, often have a story of hardship and how leaving their faith freed them. Uh, believers often have a story about how they were lifted up by their faith. This is important if you want to understand the person's point of view, so ask them. But if you just offer it without being asked, you're essentially proselytizing. And that is also not likely to be productive. In my experience, that brings up the same walls that it would if you were to offend somebody. Um, number six really just hit my list because it keeps happening and I was reminded of it recently. 
Don't hold the other person responsible for the atrocities of someone else. The Christians you're talking to are not responsible for the Crusades. The atheists you're talking to are not responsible for Pol Pot's mass murders. The Buddhists you're talking to are not responsible for the sarin gas attacks in Tokyo. And the Muslims you're talking to are not responsible for 9-11. Number seven is don't build a straw man version of the other person. This is also kind of, don't put words into their mouth. Um, if someone tells you that they are Christian, don't tell them that they must believe in Noah's Ark or Jonah and the whale. You might consider those parts of the Bible to be required to be Christian, but they may not agree. Uh, likewise, if someone tells you that they're an atheist, don't assume that they're just mad at God. Um, Number eight is disagree with the idea, but don't attack the person. It's okay to say, I don't understand how you reached that conclusion, or is there any evidence you can point me to that shows that what you're saying is true? Don't say, you have to be an idiot to believe that, or <laughs> you must be blind to not see how wrong you are. Um, those again, put the walls up, you won't make any progress after. Uh, number nine is make a point to say when you agree with the other person. This tip is mainly about building rapport. It helps bring down those walls. Just to clarify, I'm not saying that just because I'm an atheist and this other person is a Catholic, we both agree that Mormonism is silly, so we should make fun of that, and that's building rapport. <laughs> that's not a good idea either. Um, I'm really just saying, if somebody says, well, yeah, I think stealing is wrong, I mean, that's very clearly spelled out in the Bible, you say, yeah, I also think stealing is wrong. Just because we have different sources doesn't mean that we can't agree with each other um, on those issues of morality. Um, lastly, this is number 10, and the most important one, uh, don't say any Game of Thrones spoilers. <laughs> not, not everyone has read the books, and I'm not caught up yet. So, um, in closing, uh, thank you to everybody who has an interest in reaching out. It goes against our instincts, and it is sometimes stressful, but I believe it'll be more and more necessary in our society. The internet is virtually closing geographical gaps between individuals, so we're gonna come across a lot more people with different ideas and different backgrounds than ourselves. So it becomes more and more important that you know how to communicate with these people effectively. Thank you. secular humanist. Um, for some people, that's more easy to swallow than atheist, I found. Being kind of like, oh, atheist. And, you know, it's hard to make friends sometimes like that. So um, that's one of the reasons, I think, why we're all here. Um, it's interesting, Gary is not here. Um, he mentions a tribe and how we're all kind of looking for a tribe and tribalism. and. There's one huge tribe that some of us have a really hard time fitting into, and that's parenthood. And especially with um, mommy wars. I don't know if anybody here yeah. knows much about mommy wars. It really affects the new moms and babies the most. Um, because everybody has these ideas of what's right, and my way is the right way. And if you do something different than me, so your choice must be a reflection on my choice. And that's just so not true, is it? Um, parenthood should be a really great resource for all of us. And oftentimes it's very isolating, um, especially when you have small children. Um, it's hard to form those connections with people. So one of the ways that I'm doing my best <laughs> is to find ways that I can connect with other people. And one of the ways I do that is by understanding that everybody is just doing their best. And I've totally gone off script here, so sorry if I just start rambling. Because um, <laughs> you know, I am my own random different. Um, you know, these, the mommy wars and the parenting <laughs> issues that we all face, I think a lot of it is fueled by the divisiveness of the internet. Because <laughs> we all have all these resources at our fingertips and, you know, everybody has these opinions of what's right. 
And we start, I was talking to my best friend who is here, but unfortunately she has to be over there with her baby right now. Um, and we were talking about this morning about how it's one-upmanship, you know? Oh, you had such a bad day. Let me tell you about my day. <laughs> oh, your kid was hyper. Let me tell you about my kid with ADHD. Um, oh, your kid isn't reading. My kid didn't read till fifth grade. Like, I mean, it just, it keeps going and going and we try to, um, we think maybe, oh, I'm just being supportive. I'm, I'm being understanding. But it's not all the time. Sometimes it really is one up and shit. Um, so I've caught myself doing that. And you have to realize that you can't always, or I have to realize that I can't always share my experience because that's not gonna be their experience. Um, and it's a hard lesson to learn. It's a hard lesson to learn that everybody is fighting their own battle. And I've got my own battles and everybody else is fighting theirs. And there was a quote, I think, I think Gary said something about everybody knows something that you don't know. And <laughs> I actually had Bill Nye said, everyone you meet knows something you don't know. It's kind of an amazing um, concept when you really think about it. And I try to keep that advice coupled with that everybody is fighting their own battle, so be kind. Um, that's how I do my best. I just try to be understanding. Um, I try to understand that the parent that makes a different decision than me, they're doing the best they can for their child. And I'm doing the best I can for my child and for my family. And I'm not perfect. I find myself you know, falling into the judgment trap or falling into um, the one-upmanship trap. So I have made a conscious decision to just opt out of that. I can't, I can't be better than anybody else. I am not better than anybody else, and nobody else is really better than me. We're all in this together. Um, I really appreciate that that message has been said multiple times today. You know, we're all in this together. We're all part of Spaceship Earth. We're traveling. Billions of miles an hour, I think. I don't even know, millions of miles an hour through space. It's amazing that we're all here right now together. Um, yeah, that's how I do my best. I don't know if that was even five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Tamara. So um, now it's time for our moment of reflection. So we're going to try something uh, new this month that we had not done before. Um, in, the, in the past, we've had people come up to us and say that they were particularly touched by something somebody said, but they didn't have an opportunity to, sh to share that. Um, we've had other people that um, have been struggling, maybe they lost their job, or they um, were having health issues and they could use help from the community. And part of Sunday Assembly, the goal is to build a community here. So um, what we have down here is open floor time. So this is an opportunity for anybody who wants to say anything about something they heard today, anything that they want to share in their personal life, or if they have an announcement for the, for the crowd of an upcoming event or anything like that, we'll just take a few minutes for anybody who would like to say something to do so. Just jump right up if you have something. Don't, don't raise your hand or anything, it's all good. I'll go. Hi. <laughs> Hi, my name is Brenda, and I like to go by Brie. Uh, it's my first visit here. And just briefly, uh, can't hear you, Brie. Just briefly, um, I come from 31 Flavors of Christianity. That's just how I sit. And uh, I turned 50 last year, and I'm like, okay, I've been on this journey of Joseph Campbell. The Bible, the apocalypse, um, that's supposed to come every year or whatever. And, um, and so my journey has just been like naturally seeking, not like desperately seeking. And I'm here today. Um, I left my family like in Sacramento that were um, mostly like Pentecostal um, five years ago. And um, this year I started feeling a little lonely. Like I need a community. Thank you. I'm the opposite end of the spectrum. 
spectrum. Um, my name is Anna, and I saw on the meetup page an announcement for something called the Blasphemy Breakfast. And if I were a Christian, I think that name would put me off. Um, so that's what I have to say. <laughs> Personally, I realize that, that laughter is, in general, a good thing, and it isn't controllable in a lot of cases, but it's also good to look at, at how it would come across to another person. Um, I'm Michelle. I'm glad this topic was brought up. I come from a fundamentalist background, and I think that main way that um, a religion that worships the Bronze Age where God uh, can relate with another person is um, a one of battle. And so I'm so glad that uh, we're having a conversation about how to bridge the gap and, uh, and this um, you know, abandonment thing that happens in families um, where you leave your religion, it's a particularly vulnerable time. Marie, I want you to hear this. Wednesday, can you hear attention? Wednesday. Wednesday, we just started a support group for people who have left their religion. Come here, 6.30, Wednesday. Let's hear literally the reason. I like this format a little bit, and I've seen it done in some other uh, organizations named, uh, that some of us know of here in town. Um, <clears throat> a time when we care about each other and think about each other. And I just had something, not personally for me, but something that happened in my life, and I'm very happy about it. Now, my brother, who doesn't live here, lives far away in the East Coast, uh, just a week and two days ago had surgery for one kind of tumor, and he totally believed it was fully malignant cancerous, and then had to wait almost a week and find out that it was not, he was fine, and then the next day, suddenly came down with acute appendicitis, and had to have surgery this morning. <laughs> now, thank goodness, uh, thank, thank uh, doctors and, and people taking care of themselves, he went to the hospital, and I appreciate um, all that's happened but I also know that we as a community just can um, share with each other and have empathy for each other. I just saw on all your faces this wow, and then suddenly a relief. So I appreciate having this community, this secular community where we can come together and talk about our um, things that happen in our life and share with each other and get support from each other. So thank you for your thoughts. I'm, I'm, we're thinking that having good thoughts, and I know no no, probably do well. Yeah. But you have turned up. Okay. <laughs> counselors from Camp Quest West. We've always shouted out at them to say thank you, but they've been busy in the back room 
watching the kids. Um, at least this one time, uh, because we're not going to be around next month, I wanted to bring Diana Spear up um, so we can thank her at least in person. Lucila's not here, Laura's not here, but let's just by proxy thank all of the Camp Quest volunteers. West West and she, Lucila, myself, and others, we won't be here to provide childcare next month because we're going to be at Camp West. Uh, and so we're technically going to be recovering from Camp West on Sunday. Uh, so if you have children, um, you're still more than welcome, of course, to bring them next month. Uh, but I'm going to ask that maybe one or two of you, we've already got one volunteer, thank you so much for next month. And maybe one or two of you others uh, can step up and learn a little bit about the process, the procedures, the safety stuff uh, this afternoon with Diana and, uh, and then help us out next month. And then maybe we can work on some sort of like a rotating schedule for the rest of the year so that Diana, at some point, I'm sure she'd love to enjoy one of these services. So thank you. Thank everyone else from Camp West. Uh, and yeah, I'm two cents. religion by being here. I just think that it's awesome to have, we all want good in the world, and we all want, I'm sorry, I get the best way I speak. <laughs> we all want people to live better and be happy, and I think it's awesome to have a group get together. You don't have to believe how I did what do. What really got me today was looking at this, and Mormonism, which is, I strongly believe in, is on here on one little blurb on this page. It doesn't mean we're all wrong. It doesn't mean that we're all bad. Everybody else is a bad person. We're all good people. We want good things, and I love what you're doing. Gary, I think your talk was awesome, and to give pointers on how to get along with each other, because we are all here for the same reason, and we all want good in people, and I just want to say thank you for doing this. <laughs> Sunday assembly. Um, we don't have at the moment any of our normal uh, SMOOPs listed up on the website yet or in the program, but those of you who are running these small groups uh, that are sort of satellite to Sunday assembly, uh, please feel free to go ahead and add those to meet up. And if you need any technical help whatsoever, you're more than welcome to contact me. I'm happy to get that going. You can get that parenting SMOOP up again and the board game SMOOP and whatever else we had out there. Um, we also had a really uh, fun trial run yesterday at, sun, at uh, second Saturday downtown, and we're going to do that again, it sounds like, in July as well. 
um, work out a couple logistics issues, so we had a really good practice run. And so what that means is on the second Saturday, if you've ever wanted to go or you've gone in the past and enjoyed it, uh, experienced the art and culture that's out there, uh, you can hang out with us at the same time. And we can all kind of hang out as, as a group, maybe even uh, let some other people know what Sunday Assembly is all about. So you'll see that pop up on the, uh, on the meetup soon. Uh, there's a Feed the Needy or Feed the Hungry event coming up in Davis. That's on the back of the, of the program there. And uh, a couple other things. And I also just want to give a shout out. I know some of you were out there, I think it was yesterday, uh, doing the trash cleanup um, with atheists and other free thinkers celebrating their 20th anniversary of trash cleanup on the highway. So that's pretty awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so cool, that worked out well, thanks guys, that was awesome. Um, so, uh, reflecting back on what John said, uh, we are a nonprofit organization, um, we do have expenses, we have to pay for uh, Reason Center rental, coffee donuts, uh, child care expenses, things like that. Um, and so we're gonna send around uh, a little collection now, send around some hats, if you guys, if you have some money that you can donate, please drop it in the hat. If you don't, you know, tough, times are tough, you're cash strapped, don't worry about it. We're glad you're here, it's not a big deal. But if you can, please drop some money in the, in the hats. And um, as John said, all of our expenses are listed online. Here's some of them listed here. There's a full accounting on the meetup page. Uh, while you're, while the hats are going around, go ahead and meet your neighbor, talk to somebody. If, if they said, came up here and spoke, talk to them, ask them their name. Uh, maybe play a thumb war with them. <laughs> Hi, I'm John Keith, I'm the other atheist in the multi-faith group. Gary's already been approached a couple times about how to contact us, so I just thought I'd throw it out there. If you go to meetup.com and just type in multi-faith, it'll come up, so I can start now um, multi-faith discussion group. And if anybody has a group of believers or a place to meet, we are willing to expand and hold more meetings. We're right now kind of drawing just from the Roseville area. So maybe if we can get into the other areas of Sacramento, we'd be uh, quite open for that. Thank you. All right, guys. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you for your donations. That's awesome. Uh, as we wrap up here, perfect. Um, as we wrap up, at the end of this, we will have a social hour and a potluck, so there's a lot of food here. If you can bring food, don't worry, stick around, eat, uh, hang out, ask questions, talk to others, introduce yourself to somebody new. Uh, I wanted to close with uh, a reading. I just got a book um, by Sister Joan Chittister. Joan Chittister is a Catholic nun. She's uh, 79 years old, I believe, and uh, she's been a Catholic nun for over 50 years. And I read a passage from her book, uh, the other day, and it was, it just really struck me. It was absolutely perfect for this topic. So I'm going to, I took some ex excerpts from that that I'm going to read now. Differences bring us out of ourselves into a newer, fuller way of being human. We see other models of family life and begin to re-examine our own in the light of them. We begin to recognize likenesses among us that enlarge our understanding of what it means to be human beings together. Finally, we begin to realize in blazing new ways that no particular people have a monopoly on goodness or a corner on criminal, criminal character, an option on God or an ascendancy on godlessness. We come to own that we are simply all human beings together with a great deal to learn from one another if we are ever going to be fully developed, deeply sensitive, and wholly human adults. It is without doubt the gifts we get from our excursions into differences, the people we come to know whom we could never have met otherwise, the wisdom we see in those we consider simpler than ourselves, the downright goodness of those we fear because we do not know them, that makes us bigger of soul, greater of heart than we could possibly ever have been otherwise. Until we step out into the large world around us, go out of our way to meet, befriend, engage with the unknowns, we will remain forever the half of ourselves that we are now. But if we move toward even one person who is our opposite, our own spirit will grow. To be citizens of the world in a world that has itself become a global village, we must all allow ourselves to be called to life by the unknown. Then, perhaps, stunned by the sameness in us, we will no longer lose sleep worrying about the danger of immigration, the danger of strange religions, 
the danger that comes clothed in other colors, other accents, other ways to marry and bury and pray and be alive, all in the name of one humanity. Most of all, we will all come to understand that the human race has a great deal more in common than it has differences. Then the stranger, the one totally unknown to us, the one who awakens these realizations in us, will enable us to melt into the stream of life more fully human ourselves. But first, of course, to stop the fear in the night, we must reach out.